We have enough um, committee members to get started, I think. Give us one second to go live, Councilwoman Dixon. Okay. Let me know when you guys are ready. All right. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Health, Aging, and Disabilities Committee meeting. This is our first committee meeting of the 108th session of City Council. Um, I am your chair, Rashima Dixon at large. Um, and if we can have this evening our council members um, introduce themselves, please. Uh, yes, good evening. I'm Yolanda McCoy, 6th District. Hi, uh, Congo, President. I'm Council James. Brigitte. I'm sorry, Councilman Brigida Fields, 5th District. Thank you, Councilman Fields. Um, Councilman Spadola. Yes, good evening, James Spadola at large. And Councilwoman Oliver, are you able to introduce yourself? If not, um, I see Councilwoman Cabrera. Good evening, I'm here. Uh, I am Councilwoman Maria Cabrera, council member at large. And, all right. Um, and we'll just make note, Councilwoman Oliver is here as well. All right. Um, so good evening, everyone. Again, we're going to get started. We have two items on the agenda for this evening. I'm actually going to flip the agenda um, and have our, our guests go first for their presentation and then come back to the disparity study resolution. Um, so I hope you all don't mind. Uh, I wanna make sure our guests are able to um, have enough adequate time before they have to uh, leave us this evening. Um, so if we can start with, we have Christiana Care, um, who will be presenting a presentation to us on COVID-19 and their update. We have uh, Dr. Marshall Ali. Um, uh, we also had joining her is uh, Christopher Moore uh, from Christiana Care as well. And believe it or not, if I'm not correct, your Office of Health and Equity. Is that correct, Chris? All right. Okay. Um, and is, do you have, is Carla joining us as well? Or is this you two for this evening? It's just us. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. Um, so I am going to leave it all for um, Dr. Marshall Lee and um, Chris to join us in your presentation and welcome. Thank you, Councilwoman Dixon. Thank you, uh, City Council. As a uh, proud resident of the city of Wilmington, it's, it's an honor to uh, present to you tonight. Uh, so- To join my colleague, I'm also a um, Wilmington City resident. So thank you, Chris. And thank you, Councilwoman Dixon for inviting us. Okay, so um, we, uh, so Dr. Lee and I are gonna be talking to you tonight about uh, a number of topics that are related to COVID-19. And uh, so next slide, please. 
Uh, so uh, Dr. Lee is going to start out and talk to you about the, the current data around COVID-19. She's going to share with you some information around national trends, information on health disparities, and how they have been exacerbated by the pandemic. And then uh, Dr. Lee and I are going to share with you uh, Christiana Care's COVID-19 response, which includes testing, uh, vaccine distribution, and uh, the community-based work. Next slide, please. Uh, so here's a picture of us. Here's uh, That's what I used to look like before 2020. Thank you very much. Uh, and unfortunately, Carla Ponte Johnson cannot join us tonight. So I will be uh, serving both roles. Next slide, please. All right, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Chris. Thank you again, Councilwoman Dixon, for having me. As we know, uh, we've been dealing with COVID-19 for almost a year now. The um, World Health Organization declared a pandemic, I believe March 20, March 19, 2020. And who would have known that we would still be in the pandemic? This is data from last week, but as of now, there have been more than 27 million positive cases and more than, um, right now we crossed 500,000 um, deaths, unfortunately, this, this week. Next slide. There have been significant disparities during COVID-19, and unfortunately, many communities of color have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Some of our words are cut off, but I believe that this slide represents the percentage of hospitalizations from COVID-19. And as you can see, um, I believe that's the Native American column. Again, in a few of our words, for some reason, the formatting is off, um, have had the highest rate of hospitalizations Second, um, our Hispanics and Latinos and African-Americans have followed behind that with the disparity rates of COVID-19 hospitalizations. Next slide. This slide, I believe, is the age ad adjusted death rate. And as you can see from this slide, approximately Native Americans have had the highest mortality rate from COVID-19 out of 100,000, approximately 210.6 have died. And so for the African Americans, Pacific Islanders and um, Hispanics and Latinos have been um, disproportionately affected by COVID-19. I got it right. That was the death rates. Next slide. In Delaware, we've seen similar trends occur in regards to the incidence of COVID-19. Latinos have had the highest rate followed by African-Americans and the mortality rate has not followed a similar trend largely because whites are um, typically are older in the state of Delaware and the age adjusted mortality rate um, is, is similar to this, but um, whites are typically older in Delaware. And so the mortality rates in Delaware have not been higher for Latinos and blacks. Um, largely because of the age disparities, but the incidence rates is higher for Latinos and Blacks. Next slide. And this is some of the data to accompany that previous slide. Next slide. There are many factors that have gone into why these disparities um, for incidence rates, uh, incidence rates from COVID-19 exist. Going into COVID-19, we know that there are many factors such as hypertension, um, high cholesterol, heart disease, and other factors that have been seen to be risk factors for worse COVID-19 outcomes. And unfortunately, those conditions have disproportionately affected communities of color. We know that there have been um, studies that show that communities of colors have an increased exposure, largely due to an increased rate of having front frontline occupations having residential crowding, unfortunately, due to housing, we know how important that is, public reliance upon public transportation, poverty, and limited access to um, PPE, so the social determinants of health. We also know, unfortunately, that there are still disparities that exist in testing and treatment. We know that, in general, there has been unequal access to health care for communities of color, and COVID-19, unfortunately, is no different. We've been working hard at Christian Care to bridge that gap, but we know that there's still unequal access to healthcare services. Um, thankfully, most COVID treatments have are, are paid for, and, and residents 
don't have to worry about the cost, but in general, other medical services, the affordability and access to health care. Um, we know that the impact of racism and bias on health outcomes is real. Um, again, Christian Care, we're working hard to train and educate our buyer, buy, um, providers to ensure that those individual provider um, factors are not impacting the outcomes of our patient care. We also know that there's a lack of trust and stigma that we're working hard to overcome um, that is rooted, unfortunately, in a history of um, racism and other things that have unfortunately been done in the name of science. But we were working hard to overcome those stigmas um, so that we can better serve our patient as well as miscommunication. All of these factors going um, together have um, resulted in a higher incidence of COVID-19 um, mortality among African-Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, and other communities of color. Next slide. We also know that um, we're now in COVID for a year that there are some long-term health complications that have been revealed. Many individuals are continued to have um, long-term cardiac issues. There have been new diagnoses of congestive heart failure that we know have um, are attributed to COVID-19. Some people continue to have severe lung damage. Many people are now requiring dialysis due to COVID-19. Um, their long-term rashes, hair loss, um, neurological. Many people who lost their smell and taste due to COVID-19 have not returned to normal. They also have um, many psychiatric issues. The long-term um, psychiatric issues resulting from COVID-19 we're going to be dealing with them for a long time. So we must come up with um, comprehensive approaches that address um, mental health issues right now. I know that that's an area that's near and dear to our, my, my colleague, Aaron Booker at Christiana Care, Chris Moore. We're working hard to come up with some comprehensive solutions to address the mental um, health disparities. Next slide. Treatment, um, just a few updates. There is some good news on the horizon. There are new medications that have received emergency use authorization from the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. The newest one are called monoclonal antibodies. And the goal of those medications are to actually decrease the need for hospitalization. So individuals who test positive and have significant risk factors, they can talk to their primary care doctor and to see if they are a potentially a candidate for the monoclonal antibody infusions. So that's information that we're trying to get out to the public. These medications have been shown to reduce the need for hospitalization. So very, very important. So if you can share that with your constituents, um, that's very important information. Also, a few antivirals have been studied and remdesivir is one medication that has received FDA approval for the use in hospitalized patients, which has shown to be effective. There are several other clinical trials underway as well. Next slide. All right, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Chris. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, so Christiana Care's mission is to serve its neighbors. And we, we do this guided by our, our values of love and excellence. And I, I, I can think of no other time in my 15 years of Christiana Care where uh, every ounce of love and every ounce of excellence came, came into play in, in supporting the communities that we serve and also the communities where we live uh, through, this, through this pandemic. And uh, one of Christiana Care's first, first responses was to work in collaboration with community partners to establish testing sites in addition to the, the static sites that were at pharmacies and the pop-up sites that the, the state and the county were, were organizing. Uh, so in the spring of 2020, Christiana Care worked in collaboration with Kingswood Community Center and the Latin American Community Center to create testing sites where uh, community members would be able to access uh, testing, but also services for free uh, to be able to get a COVID diagnosis, but also to be connected if they did test positive or screened positive for social determinants of health barriers where they would work in collaboration with a community health worker who would help them after that visit to be able to connect to resources and to healthcare, whatever it is that they needed. Uh, and also it's important to note, and this is, this is a really important uh, call out right now is that language services, our, our, our great uh, colleagues in language services were on site 
to be able to uh, provide language services or interpreter services to patients who were not English speaking to ensure that there would be no barrier in them being able to receive care. Next slide, please. Uh, so the next two slides uh, show the, the patient, the number of patients tested, but, and then the positivity rate. So you will see that there is, that they're fairly uh, congruent with the, with the trends with the pandemic throughout the year. So this is for Latin American Community Center and Kingswood Community Center. Next slide. And again, so fairly congruent, you'll see LACC, there's a bit of a, 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 a earlier peak and then another peak in August before the, there was the peak around the holidays. Uh, so next slide, please. I'm going to provide some information about updates regarding the COVID-19 vaccine. As you know, we have two vaccines that have received emergency use authorization by the FDA. It is, uh, they are the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. People oftentimes ask, Marshall or Dr. Lee, which one do you recommend? I recommend both. I actually recommend whichever one you can get your hand on the quickest, the soonest out of these two, because they really rely on a similar technology, which is mRNA technology. And we like to reinforce that the mRNA technology that was used to develop the COVID-19 vaccine is not new. So despite the name of Operation Warp Speed, this technology has been around for almost a decade. And so it's well studied. We know about its risk factors. They just used it um, to specify it to the, the outside markers of the COVID-19 vaccine so that your cells are able to recognize the virus and better respond to it. You are not being injected with the virus, but your body is being injected with the code to identify the virus. So we try to explain that to the patient. Both vaccines require two doses. Pfizer vaccine, the doses are supposed to be 21 days apart. And there's a, a, um, there's a you can get it two days before if you need to, um, but we recommend 21 days. And then with the Moderna vaccine, it's 28 days. Many people had delays in getting that vaccine. The CDC has released guidance that said the recommended time period is at least within six weeks. And some people unfortunately have had delays even in receiving their vaccine within six weeks, but they released the CDC new guidance that said, even if there's a delay beyond six weeks, you do not need to repeat the series. So you just need to get the vaccine as soon as possible. Um, both vaccines have to be stored in cold temperatures, but we know that the Pfizer vaccine has to be stored in an ultra cold um, environment. And both of them have similar effectiveness. Pfizer is 95%. Moderna is 94.1, which is almost equivalent. And then they're both approved in similar ages. So we have not received approval um, for youth, but there are several studies undergoing now to study the effectiveness in youth. And they're saying that hopefully by the fall, we will have approval to administer it to youth. Next slide. Um, Dr. Lee, just one second. Um, I see your hand, um, Council President Congo. I think you're on mute, Council President. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you, Chairwoman. I want to thank both of you for um, for joining us this evening. Really good information. I do have a question. You said that um, when we get the vaccine, we're not being inject we're not being injected with the virus. I didn't I didn't know that. Correct. The Pfizer okay. and the Moderna vaccine, they're injecting you with the technology, so the mRNA. That's the code okay. to recognize the virus. So there are some other vaccines that have not been approved in the United States. They use a killed version of the virus, but the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine do not contain any components of the virus. So, yeah. Okay. Are you able to speak to, because they, they, they say after the second dose, your body, some people start to feel sick. And they say that that's because it's the, it's the vaccine working, but then some people don't get sick. So can, can you help? Can you give me some clarity around that? Yes. If that's possible. Yes. This slide is talking about the side effects. So there is a known side effect profile that, um, that individuals that we call them expected side effects that typically resolve with, within 24 to 48 hours. 
we do not know why some individuals have worse side effects than others. But our understanding is, is that it's a good sign if people have side effects that your body is, it has been primed. And what that means is that it was primed with the first dose and by it receiving that code the second time, your body is able to recognize the virus now. And so your body's responding as if it was exposed to the virus. So it's a good sign that it caught on the first time you got the, the, um, the immunization. But it's not a, we don't, it's un, we don't know if people who have less side effects, if the vaccine is less effective, if that's what you're asking right now. Okay, yes, okay, all right, thank you. That's thank what I was wondering. You. And so this is the known side effect profile. Um, individuals typically have more severe side effects after the second vaccine than the first vaccine, but those symptoms should still resolve within 24 to 48 hours. And so we provide our patients with guidance on what is expected and what is severe and when they should seek care. That's very important, but we made sure to let people know you can anticipate to have these side effects because we didn't want to deter them from getting future vaccines out of fear that the, that was something was going wrong. Next slide. This data is national data. It is about the demographics of those who had received the COVID-19 vaccine nationally by January 14th. And unfortunately at that time, only um, out of the almost 7 million vaccines that were distributed, only 5.4% of those vaccines had been used by African-Americans. Um, Latinos, 11.5% compared to 60% of the vaccines that had gone to um, whites. Mm -hmm. Next slide. We know that there are many factors that play into um, the disparity in the vaccine distribution numbers that I mentioned on the previous slide. We know that their access is an issue, but we also know that there was some hesitancy among African-Americans. And that's why we've been doing our due diligence to spread the word and provide education to communities as well as increase access, um, accessibility of the vaccine to those communities. And so thankfully we were able to work and have been working in close partnership with the state of Delaware. And we have held a number of community vaccination events. The one that I was most, in, most involved with was the one that was held on February the 5th and we strategically partner with our community partners that we have pretty good relationships with and said, hey, we have a distribution of vaccines. We know that you care for underserved communities. You provide different services to them. Can you assist us with registering individuals? Um, and we made sure that we reached out to those community organizations that were serving individuals from zip codes that had been most impacted by COVID-19. And so they assisted us with registering elders from those zip codes and it was very effective. But we knew that going into this, that when we distribute the vaccine that we needed to have equity in the middle of all of our planning. But a lot of people, um, I know we're not happy with um, the limited supply of the vaccine. So we just try to tell everyone there's a lot of factors that go into how quickly we can get the vaccine out. But we, um, we're dependent upon authorization. Only two vaccines have been approved. That's the Moderna and the Pfizer, the supply. We know that there's a limited supply that the state gets and has to equitably distribute across the state. So the state, we know that demand, we know that unfortunately some communities are demanding it and requesting the vaccine more. And that's why we're really trying to better educate underserved communities so that if they have access to the vaccine that they will have uptake and that they will take it. And we know that the distribution is key. It's important that we devise strategies that can get the vaccine to underserved community. But at the end of the day, we at Christiana Care keep equity in the middle of everything that we do. Next slide. So in planning for our February 5th event, we use the combination of things, but this is what we're doing with our community vaccination events. This is some of the flow. We use data and feedback to inform our strategy. We use the COVID-19 incidence rates to identify what were the zip codes and communities that we really needed to prioritize to, and to get our elders registered. And we also got feedback from the community to say, hey, what are some of the best sites that we possibly could host um, um, vaccination sites at? And so we do have future events planned that we're finalizing in collaboration with the state. 
Um, but we def we've been working on our community partners to identify those, those sites, not just saying, hey, what Christiana Care thinks is best, but we're working with our community partners to identify those places. We've been getting community engagement, feedback on and recommendations from um, recruitment to enrollment. We've been partnering with trusted community partners to not only just provide us with input, but we know that they are better messengers and that if we could properly convey um, information about the COVID-19 and answer our trusted community partners um, questions that they could better, they could be messengers to the larger community at large. So they've been assisting us to register people for the vaccination site. Um, we've been increasing vaccine availability by ensuring that we get the vaccine to communities that need them the most. So we've been prioritizing those communities um, within the, the um, allotment that we've received at Christiana Care. We know the importance of being culturally competent and addressing hesitancy head on and, and um, talking to people, um, providing information that's most important to them and meets and address their questions. We've been providing at our um, vaccination sites, we have translation services and literacy supports available as Chris mentioned, because we know that um, we have to be ex available to answer our community's questions and, and, and be culturally competent. Um, we've been developing effective systems for tracking distribution so that we can ensure that we're, um, our vaccine distribution plans are working and that we're meeting the most underserved communities. And we have also tried to be accessible for questions and concerns. My phone blows up on the regular um, and I'm accessible. I hope to be accessible because I really don't want hesitancy to be the deterrent for why people um, don't get the vaccine. Next slide. Yeah. Um, one second. Um, I saw your hand up, um, Councilwoman Fields. Did you have a question? Yes, I did. Um, really quick question. Um, I know that you know, um, you were out doing, um, I want to say, you know, um, on spot um, vaccinations. And were, did you ever go to, did you go to Quaker Hill Apartments? Was that one of your sites? I'm not sure because some of our community partners assisted mm -hmm. us with okay. going to some of those sites. I don't have the full list of the places that they went. They have okay. the full list. But um, what zip code is it located? 19801. More than likely because we did prioritize 19801, 19802. Okay, one of my I'm one of my seniors had a question because they they received the the Pfizer, but they ended up signing the sheet for the McDermott. So that was one of the confused, you know, they were kind of concerned about that. So you think you can clarify, you know, clear that up, or you know, is it one and the same? The good thing is when they come back for their second dose, we have on file what vaccine they received. A lot of people have been losing their cards. And so we can identify if they received the vaccine at our site, we can tell which vaccine they received. Did I answer your question? I, I think so. I, I, yeah, well, she wanted to know like if she was, if they tell, if they told her she received the, the Pfizer and you know, I guess it's a um, release, release form or something that you have to sign. Yes. Um, I think she, it could be one or the other, but say if she got the Pfizer, but she signed a release for, for Moderma, she wanted to know why was that? Did you run out of sheets or, you know, what was, the, what was that? It may have been the education sheet hmm. and I'm not sure exactly what happened. I can provide you with my information. Okay. And um, Councilwoman Dixon has my information. So I would love to work with her to figure out what's going on with in her individual case. Okay, so you said you'll provide me with your information and then we can talk? Yes, Councilwoman okay. Dixon has my information. Yes, ma'am. Oh, she has it. Oh, okay. So, she, okay. Um, yeah, I can provide that to you, um, Councilwoman Fields. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I saw Councilwoman Oliver. Did you have your hand up? Yes, I'm sorry. I, uh, I was having some problems with my phone. Um, I think um, Councilwoman... Um, Feels I was kind of asking the same question. Um, I guess my question would be, does it matter which one of the shots they take first? They should receive whatever dose they receive for the first one, they should receive the second dose of that same vaccine. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, All right. And you can continue, um, Dr. Lee. 
I think that's all the hands that are up currently. Thank you. Mr. Moore, I'll go with this one, Chris. And so this is just more detail about our recent vaccination event. We, in collaboration with the um, Department of Health, um, we hosted a 10 hour community event at the Community Education Building on February 5th. And we were able to um, allocate 850 doses, dispersed 850 doses to our elders that were 65 and above in alignment with 1B, that's the approved category now. And we concentrated areas, um, our effort to connect community partners and leaders to get the word out. And so we did, we, um, did a combination of things. We had a, a um, refined registration process where we only asked their name, date of birth and telephone number because we know that um, elders were having difficulty reporting the additional information and there was some hesitancy even in that. And our information was through phone calls because we also know that individuals are having access issues um, registering on the online portals. Our second dose event is scheduled for this week. So we're making sure that the word is out to our community partners, but it's only for individuals who receive their first dose at the February 5th event. Next slide. Out of the um, doses that we were allotted, we were able to vaccinate 852 people. And as you see, we were pretty successful um, getting the word out into the 19801, 19802 zip codes. Um, so 62 from 19801, um, 128 from 19802. So many of the high need areas that have been disproportionately affected for COVID-19 we were able to get a number, um, a, a large share of elders from those populations and communities. And out of the 852 vaccines, 564 were African-American. And so what I've been letting people know when they say that African-Americans are hesitant, they are hesitant, but they want additional information and the messenger matters. And so I'm like, we need to increase the access to the vaccine and they will take it, but you have to be available to assist them with answering their questions. So I'm really proud of those demographics. 94 Hispanics, as well as 43 Spanish speaking individuals. So I'm really glad that we had our language services on site that day. Any questions? Okay, next slide. All right, so, uh... We, we know that uh, 80, about 80% 80 of what, what happens in somebody's life as, as, it, as it, it relates to their health happens outside of the hospital walls or outside of the doctor's office. So uh, Christiana Care's community health section and its partner, its internal and external partners have again, risen to the challenge of being able to uh, meet the needs of the community. And uh, we, we have done that in a number of ways. Uh, one has been an increase in access to virtual care. So uh, that includes primary care visits, uh, emergency visits, mental health visits, uh, even some of our non-clinical programs use virtual, virtual means to be able to connect with patients to do everything from connecting to uh, food closets or uh, nutritional supports to helping individuals get connected to legal supports. Uh, in addition, Christiana has invested, uh, invested wisely in uh, something called Unite Delaware, which is a closed loop referral to uh, work in partnership with community organizations to be able to uh, provide uh, social service and uh, different connections to care to be able to address the mediators of health outcomes. And Unite Delaware is unique because it ensures that the referral will be addressed and that the case will be closed. And everybody involved in the patient care knows yes. on the same page with what, the, with what is going on. Uh, a few other things. So, uh, in addition, and I said this before, and I, I think, and Dr. Lee mentioned it, I want to say it again, that our language services section within the hospital is also out in the community as well to ensure that that uh, if somebody is not English speaking, that they are still able to access the same level and the same care that, that, that English speaking individuals are able to receive. Uh, we feel very strongly about that access and access being equal across the board. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in addition, uh, there have been a number of um, uh, testing in community sites 
There have been uh, supports out there for neighbors or uh, for community partners and neighbors. Uh, in addition, community messaging and education around PPE use, around the importance of testing, and now more specifically around the importance of vaccines, as, as Dr. Lee mentioned, uh, and uh, virtual presence. So like I mentioned, the healthcare services being done virtually, but also education. So Dr. Lee and many of, of, of her clinical colleagues have done Facebook live events. They have participated in live hall or town halls to be able to answer uh, community questions and be able to offer real time information uh, so that so that everybody knows, everybody understands the, the full impact of, of COVID-19. Next slide, please. Uh, here's another example. Uh, so Dr. Leroy Hicks talking to the uh, the barbershop and the uh, the hair salon communities. Next slide, please. Uh, Dr. Lee, if I could, I, I be, you were so critical in all of this. Would you mind talking about uh, what what these pictures are showing? Yes. So going into COVID, we were working to design a. A, an initiative to address hypertension disparities among African-American men, and then COVID hit. But one thing that I know as a researcher, community engaged researcher, is that you have to show your partners that the relationship is mutually, mutually, mutually beneficial and that you care about their needs. And so we know that COVID caused many of our barbershop partners that we were planning on launching the hypertension initiative in that they were having financial challenges after being closed for so long. And they also expressed that they were having difficulty accessing needed PPE to reopen. And so um, we, we also knew that barbers and salon stylists are trusted partners. And we provided the barbers um, educational resources so that when they reopened, they could educate their clients about the importance of practicing safe hygiene and staying safe to prevent the transmission of COVID-19. But we, more importantly, we wanted to show our barbers that we were good partners and support them um, with providing cleaning supplies, masks, and other materials that they needed to stay safe and keep their doors open at the beginning of the pandemic. So that was, that was, um, they really want my heart having, being able to do that for our partners to show them that we really appreciate all that they do for our communities. Next slide. So in addition to that, the uh, we know that in, along with the pandemic, community needs and patient needs continued. So our the community health programs that, that, that I have the privilege of, of leading uh, transformed themselves from in-person experiences to virtual experience. So the what you're seeing, uh, in front of you are three three unique programs. So Boot Camp for New Moms works specifically with new moms. There's also a, a dad version of this that creates community uh, for new for new parents uh, and also brings in veteran parents who have experienced uh, raising raising a baby and everything that that entails. Uh, the in the center you'll see a, a gentleman named Raheem Curry who is a public ally. Shout out to public allies. And uh, Rahim is part of our workforce development program at Christiana Care and uh, was able to give a, a, a beautifully motivational talk to teens virtually about what happens after high school and how his choice to not go to college right after high school was okay. And it has, and what his life has been like. And it was really, really quite ins inspirational. And uh, third, you'll see a, a, a flyer for a community baby shower that, uh, normally would be hosted in person for 200, 300 uh, expectant or new mothers. Uh, and now this is being done online and also being done in Spanish. Next slide, please. Chris, I forgot to mention oh, that yeah. in addition to the barbershop COVID-19 kits that we received funding from Newcastle County's Health Equity Grant, and we've been providing kits to communities and we're assembling kits now because we also will be distributing more kits to local businesses that are serving um, underserved communities. And I also know that the Office of Community Health has invested a number of resources in providing um, safety kits to community members. We actually distributed safety kits at our February 5th event to the elders that came for the vaccination. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Uh, and then uh, to round out the, the presentation, there's a list of resources which you may find helpful. Uh, next slide. There's our contact information. Uh, 
uh, Councilwoman Dixon also has my contact information, like my phone number, if any questions or anything, anything that I can be of service for. And uh, as, as Dr. Lee said, we're, we are happy to, happy to help. And I feel confident in saying Carla Aponte Johnson would also as well. She's my, she's my other partner in crime. So we're here, we are here to support. And that's it. Awesome. Um, Councilwoman Oliver. Yes, um, I just wanted to thank your guests. Um, I, I uh, was able to work with them a little bit over in Kingswood and I do a tremendous job. And um, Jesse and James, that picture is in the third district and that's a barbershop that I do support. Uh, it's one of the last minority barbershops um, in our community. So I'm down there on a regular basis. I just wanted to give you um, Council Chair, uh, kudos. This was an excellent presentation and overdue. And I really appreciate the work that Christiana Care does. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Oliver. Um, and Councilwoman Cabrera. Yes, um, I had a question because I know that um, I'm on the board of Los Jardines and I've had people call me, especially the seniors that are living in high rises and a lot of the Latino seniors that don't know where to go to get the vaccine. So I understand that they did go out to Ingleside. Now, is that Christiana Care? Or is that a different group that's doing that, the Department of Health? Um, and will vac on-site vaccinations, especially for our seniors, be something uh, that we could be looking forward to? I know for sure that the Department of Public mm -hmm. Health, Health has been making its round to high rises to um, provide some on-site vaccination. Mm -hmm. And I understand that their plan is to continue to visit those high rises. I'm, um, I'm relatively new to Delaware. I've been for two years, so I'm learning the different high rises mm -hmm. and I'm not exactly sure if that's one of the sites that our community partners went to when they were helping to recruit, but I can look into it. And I know that. Follow-up question, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, the other thing is, I know that I personally, as an essential health care worker, had signed up through the Christiana site because they said that was a little more user friendly than the Department of Health site. So can you give me an idea of what the time frame is from the time that a person might, you know, signs up and when they might get the vaccine? I still haven't heard back from Christiana about that. And that was a few weeks ago. But I have other people that are signing up. They're still seniors. And I'm trying to give them like an idea of how soon from the time that you put your name on that list would they be called? Like, how are the numbers moving? Unfortunately, I do not have those specifics, but I know that the, um, what is it? The, 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 the want for vaccine is, is outweighs the supply of the vaccine right now. And I really hate that we don't have a good distribution supply of the vaccine on a national level. So we're really dependent upon how much vaccine comes into Delaware. So I'm glad that we have many Delawareans who want the vaccine. I just wish that the supply was able to keep up with it. But I do know that the state of Delaware is doing its best to get the vaccine out to us as soon as possible. That's why this vaccination event that we're doing, we're actually targeting, um, I don't like the word target, but we're prioritizing high risk um, underserved communities that have been most affected who are having challenges even going on Christiana Care's site to register. Yep. And we even know that there are limitations there and so we would love to work with you guys, get your input on what are the additional sites that we should be providing outreach to. Um, we're not at the place right now to do on-site vaccination, but those are things that hopefully down the line in conjunction with what the Department of Public Health is doing, we would like to do in the future as well. But definitely your input and recommendation on the communities that we need to be prioritizing, that's exactly what we need because we know that uh, we need your assistance. We're not trying to be experts. We want to partner with as many people as possible to get to meet the needs of our community as best as possible in the short term as we have limited doses of vaccine. So definitely, I wrote down what um, how I think that high rise is spelled, but I would love to connect with you offline to get your recommendations on how we can um, get the word out and get our elders um, better vaccinated with the limited Thanks. doses we have. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, and thank you for the work that everyone is doing. We really, truly appreciate it. Thank you all for all that you do as well. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, next, Councilwoman McCoy. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my question is, uh, because you actually brought it up, because of the fact the vaccines are kind of like right now are still in the little short supply, are we having any issues of waste? Are we have making certain that there is a person who is available to receive every vaccine that we have available at these sites? We've been doing an amazing job of not wasting vaccines. We um, have wait lists available and we keep them handy. I receive at least 20 calls a day on my cell phone. And so we really even going into the vaccination event, we double, triple check to confirm, do our best to make sure that the people are coming, that they know about the event. But also before the end of the event, we're, we're keeping tabs like, okay, we thought we would have put out this many by now. We, we don't have that many people. So we already have a plan in place to contact elders to do our best not to um, waste vaccine. Last night at eight o'clock, I was getting phone calls. Hey, you know anybody that can get up here within the next before it expires? So Christian and Care is really doing a good job to okay. one prioritize underserved communities, but also making sure that we limit the amount of waste because we know how precious these vaccines are. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. That's good to hear that you're making sure that that happens. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, Councilwoman Fields, did you have? I saw your hand raised again. Would you want to? You have another question? No, I didn't. I hit the button by mistake. Okay. That's why I was shaking my head. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you kind of went quickly, but I want to double check just in case. <laughs> no problem. Um, again, uh, I think this is more so a follow up to what uh, what Dr. Lee had helped us set up previously with Dr. Hicks, um, where he came last uh, year to talk to us about uh, what's happening as far as the racial disparities um, after uh, we've seen, I think, and, and even in the data that was presented, there was uh, the showcase that September and October numbers had went down um, and trying to figure out why that was a difference in comparison to the other months um, that were, uh, had slowly either increasing back up in those months. Um, and we know we've been wanting to keep track, especially because so many Wilmingtonians are trying to figure out, you know, how to navigate between testing and vaccinations um, and the process. And again, trying to make sure they get factual information and educated as much as possible um, in the space of why it's important to do one or the other and not really forcing it as a, you know, meanwhile, like you don't have to get a vaccination but we're strongly encouraging that you do, right? So, um, and we, you know, it's not a mandate, but we're trying to make sure that our, our communities are as healthy as possible. So um, I, I appreciate and hope that, you know, you guys will come back and, and keep giving us updates. Cause I think it, for us, we're trying to make sure that our numbers and, and I know council members, you know, are concerned heavily about their community, their uh, members in their community uh, to make sure that they're taken care of. And there's also been access around um, essential workers and the plans that, you know, as DPH and, and the governor's office are having different conversations that, you know, that becomes in the forefront of how we communicate that education um, to our communities too, to know when you're up next or when you have an opportunity. So I think if we can figure out how to do some of those things, that would allow us to make some, some real effective change. Um, and I will say, I know a question that came to me was about, somebody was saying that, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Lee, please do if it is. But they were saying like, if, the, if you don't get the vaccinations now, um, people are afraid that it may um, either um, evolve into something else later on. Like for example, could, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of the word. Mutate. Yes, it could mutate, thank you. Um, and to, and we don't know how it could, the difference of how it'll make the longer you wait to get the vaccination. So is that true or is that still being filtered or figured out? The great thing right now is that right now, the preliminary data is showing that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine are pretty effective with the current mutations that we have, but oh. COVID is one of those things that I just want to change it to a, a question mark because there's so many unknowns in regards to COVID-19 that we don't know yet. We know that virus have the potential to mutate um, and we know that if individuals, that our behaviors can affect the rate that it mutates as well. 
And so I wouldn't go as far to say as what you said, but I would say that we know that mutations are developing on a daily basis and that we would recommend that individuals get it as soon as possible because thankfully the vaccines have been shown to be effective with the current mutation. Gotcha, okay. All right, thank you. And then can you just quickly just tell us uh, what's in the kits? Cause um, she has some really great items that are in the kits that she's given out to barbershops and hair salons. So I just wanted to make sure that people knew what was in those kits that you were giving out. Yes, so I think the item that the shops enjoyed the most were big posters that had, um, that provided um, explanations for how to keep safe. So the importance of wearing your mask, washing your hands, Additionally, we had Barbicide. If you guys don't know, Barbicide is the preferred cleaning um, item, steril sterilization item for barbers. It doesn't damage their, their, their clippers. And so um, they were happy because they gave us some street, street cred. They knew that we did our research. Everybody loves Barbicide. And they were actually having a, a hard time getting it to Delaware. But because we were buying it a bulk, we were able to get it delivered here. So the stores, they didn't have it in stock. And we had masks, gloves. I'm trying to think, did we have anything else in there? But, um, and we had clipper side. So barber side and clipper side, um, those were items that are, were high demand with our barbershops and salons. And I know that they are appreciated. We had face shields. I think we probably had some more items in there, but I can't remember them right now, but it was a great um, project initiative. We had some other items. As I mentioned, we're working to, um, finalize, the, get, get the rest of the supplies in for our business kits. So we would love to partner with you all too to make sure that we're getting items to the businesses that need them the most as well. And hopefully we have all those items within the next couple of weeks. Thank you so much. And uh, Councilman Fields, <laughs> no, I just saw your hand. <laughs> I just messed with you. The, uh, <laughs> the, um, but thank you again for um, the presentation. Um, and again, uh, don't let this be your first and your last. So we, we would love to, to see you again and hear more information on, um, on how everything is evolving and, and changing, especially as we, we talk about the Wilmington landscape and the disparities and, um, and making sure that our folks get taken care of, which I know that you both uh, want to make sure that, that the equity is done uh, within Christiana Care and, and within the city. So uh, we appreciate everything you do um, and will continue to do. And thank you again for coming this evening and giving us your presentation. Thank you for the opportunity to present and thank you, Chris, for taking me up on my offer to present with me. And I'm sorry that I have to leave, but I'm heading to a hospital meeting. I, I would have stayed, but I definitely look forward to coming back. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thanks for having us. It, it really has been an honor. So, and we'll take you up on the offer and see you again. All righty. And that was my apologies to anyone from the public. And I'm sorry um, that I didn't get a chance to do that before they got off. Um, is there anyone from the public that we could at least take down your question if we don't have the answer? All right. Okay. Um, so the next um, agenda item for this evening and last agenda item is um, the disparity study. Um, there's a resolution um, in orders to, uh, in regards to the economic opportunities and healthcare well, economic development and healthcare options um, and access um, for um, Wilmington. Um, and that is sponsored by myself. Um, more so we wanted to make sure as we put in funding previously in the last administration, in our last session of council um, regarding disparity study that we wanted to, to make sure that that actually gets uh, done um, and that we really have a racial as well as social um, and healthcare lens to the work that is being done uh, by our city and as well as our departments to make sure that we're looking at making sure that we're uh, equity as well as being is happening within the city and as well as our services that we're providing to the community. And without that data and that information, we don't know, you know, really what we're working with and as, and as far as, um, especially in our economic development, are we, you know, working with enough small businesses? Are we working with enough uh, minority businesses? Are we working with enough, um, are we working with enough um, 
disadvantaged businesses? Um, how are we making sure that contracts are put out to organizations and really trying to be make sure that we give people equal opportunity in order to get opportunities in the city around economics? And then if there are and there's organizations that do that in the state. I know in the county, they have an organization called ProRank that actually gives their, their city council data on how the percentages of um, the racial breakdown as well as demographics on who's working on these different work sites um, and opportunities. And, uh, and it served them well by having that information um, so that they can make you know, better policies around you know, those things that may need to still be firmed up and connected on. Um, so, um, and I know, I wanted to make sure that I didn't miss any points, um, but yeah, basically we just wanted to make sure that the, the data collection that we're doing as well as the methods, the procedures, um, the transparency um, that we have on data sharing um, practices when our city departments, and we know that some of our city departments have started to put out information regarding what their department is as far as numbers, the projects they're working on, um, and just trying to make sure that we have as much information as possible um, on the one on part of the website that we have currently, but how can we uh, validate that more and give more um, input into some of the other departments that may not be currently um, on that system now. Um, and then so city council would be requesting the city to have a disparity study done um, and by December 31st, 2021, and that which will lead to the creation of equitable uh, policies in the city for local businesses, residents, and to authorize the commission uh, for various studies um, on social health and economic wellness uh, for the climate of the city. So again, it's more so to, to firm up on and, and pushing and strongly encouraging the the city to really push on getting disparity study done. Now that we have the funding, um, the state also has already done a RFP process for their disparity study. Um, the county had just finished up their uh, RFP for their disparity study as well. Um, so we wanna make sure that the city is, is doing this part in the same case um, as other parts of our state are. Uh, and Councilwoman Fields. Okay, um, thank you, um, Madam Chair. So who's going, I mean, have you contracted anyone or is this just a resolution to get it out there to, to get the funding done before, before you even look, before you even start contracting someone or do you have people in mind? No, so we, we provided, we put funding in the budget, uh, in the last fiscal budget. Um, we just put funding toward it as a, as a council, um, as part of the, the overall budget. Um, we have not done the RFP process. We don't have anybody in mind at this point. Um, there has been an organization that from Atlanta who has come previously um, and talked to us about why, um, disparity study, but no one is um, selected yet. And there will have to be a whole RFP process in place before we can um, make any selections. This is more so a resolution just to urge the administration to make sure they can execute on doing the disparity study. And this will be the first one, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. it will be the first one. It will be the first one. Yes. Okay, but there's other departments throughout the city of Wilmington that's already took the initiative to do it themselves without having administration do it. Correct. Yeah, okay. so the, yep, the county just put out their RFP. So we would do the same process the state has done, which is um, put in for an RFP process and get people to apply and then uh, work on getting their disparity study done. Okay, and this is more geared towards healthcare or just economic, uh, explain it a little bit more because I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused. Yep. So it'll be across all those things. So we wanna see the disparities around economic development, around social issues, as well as healthcare issues. Uh, oh, okay. So we see the disparities okay. in all those across the board okay. to make sure that they're equitable in all those, sec in all those sectors. Um, thank you. Yep. Um, Councilwoman McCoy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, my question is, I just wanted to be 
reminded. I know we put some money towards it because I do recall it last session. Wanted to find out whether or not it will there need to be more added to in order to get this accomplished, or will we be relying on the city to make certain that they are uh, they meet that? Um, I guess the rest of the funds that are required to get this done. Um, I don't know if there are additional <laughs> funds that need to be added, um, but um, what I will say is we put over a million dollars in that, uh, in the last fiscal budget for it, um, and they typically cost about five or 20, depending on how in-depth you go, mm -hmm. um, it can either be probably around 500,000 to a million, depending on how in-depth you want the study to be. Okay, um, thank you. Because that was actually about to be my next question. I'm like, please remind me of exactly what the, uh, the amount <laughs> was. I'm like, I said, because I have to admit, I don't recall off the top of my head, but thank you. Thank um, you very much. Um, and Marcel, correct me if I'm wrong uh, on that as well. But I believe that's that's the amount we put overall in that in that part. Um, and but we can get the exact number. Okay. For all the council members, um, Councilwoman Oliver. Sure, mute. Yep. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I just wanted to say I'm glad that um, we're following up on that because I know. President Hanifa Shabazz, former President Hanifa, was very, uh, very adamant about that study. So I'm glad to see that's picked up and I'm glad uh, Council Session 108 is following through with that. As you said, I was going to say it was a lot of money. I didn't know the exact amount. I was going to say mm -hmm. I know it was a lot of money in the um, budget for that. So that's good. Thank you. Yes. Yes. And to your point, yes, Councilman Oliver, that, that was started in the 107th and, and Council President with the um, National League of Cities. Was a, was a huge part of um, why we decided to do it and um, and finding out all the information on it. So, yes. Thanks a lot. That would be all. Good job. Um, any other um, questions regarding the legislation? And I know I wanted to, I know um, Councilwoman Cabrera um, had agreed to be a co-sponsor um, as well on it. Um, and I just didn't know if there were any other questions or um, that individuals have regarding the legislation. Councilwoman Oliver. Now I want to uh, please add me as a co-sponsor, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Councilwoman McCoy. Same, same here, please ask me as a co-sponsor. All right, so noted. I'm being funny, uh, Madam Chair, I was raising my hand, but I'll, <laughs> you had me as a co-chair, please. Yes, I will add you, thank you, <laughs> Councilwoman Fields. And all right, so um, we will add, make sure that you guys are added to the um, resolution and thank you for signing on as well. Um, that is the last item on our agenda for this evening. Um, is there any questions from the public regarding uh, the disparity study? All right, seeing none. Um, that again is our last agenda item for this evening and I will um, entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn, I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Sound like the eyes have it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you all have a great night and thank you again for joining us for our Health Aging and Disabilities Committee meeting. We'll see you. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.